I'd like to talk today about something that I think is an incredibly powerful tool, something that can break down cultural borders and help create a more tolerant, connected, loving world. It's not by any means a new concept, and it may at first seem a bit subtle in the context of the conversation about the major global issues. But I think if you look closely at it, you'll find that it has tremendous benefit. But I'm not actually going to tell you what it is. I'd like to try and show you, which requires a little bit of audience participation. So what I would like you to do is I'd like you to look around at the others in the audience, and I would like you to choose one person who is a complete stranger to you, just silently in your mind, um, a man or a woman, just one person, and lock their face in your mind. So I'll give you a second to do that. A stranger. Okay. Now what I'd like you to do is also silently in your mind, I'd like you to gauge your level of connection to that person on a scale of one to 10. One being that this is a stranger, so you don't really care about this person. 10 being that you care deeply, intensely, about this person. So I'll give you also a second to come up with your number. And be honest, nobody's going to ask you what your, question, what your number is. OK. So now that you have your face and your number, I'd like to tell you a little bit about your person. If you chose a woman, what if I tell you that her name is Masha and that she's actually Russian? She works in a hotel in Moscow as a dejonaya, which is essentially a hall monitor. And what if I tell you that if you chose a man, his name is Roland, and he's a French ice cream maker? What if I tell you that the first time I ever met Masha, I walked into my hotel room, and she was inside trying on my clothing? <laughs> she was wearing my black Italian leather skirt, and she was holding a pair of very expensive heels and admiring herself. And then she said, oh my god, when I walked in. <clears throat> what if I tell you that the first time I met Roland, he bit my head off. I was late to interview him. I was writing a book about the Dordogne region of France, and I had gotten terribly lost. So I called him for further directions, and he said, you Americans, you think you are so important that we will drop everything to talk to you. But I, I needed the interview, so I begged him to let me still come. And he said, fine, and hung up on me. So what if I tell you that when I walked into my hotel room and I found Masha trying on my skirt, that she was horrified, and she was completely shocked because she hadn't expected me to be there. I'd come back unexpectedly. I was um, totally sick. I had come down with this really serious flu, and all I wanted to do was just sleep. I wasn't even angry. I was mostly just, I pitied her for her embarrassment. And so I said, it's okay, it's okay, I just need to sleep. And I crawled into bed as she changed back into her, her uniform. And I woke up some time later, and I went out into the hallway to find her, and I asked her to bring me some food. Um, and even though it wasn't her job to feed me, she brought me rolls and cheese and tea. And during the day, I sort of drifted in and out of sleep and delirium. And every time I would wake up, I would feel her swabbing my face with a damp cloth. Or I'd sit up to take a sip of tea, and she'd help me. And I'd lie back down, and she'd tuck the sheets under my chin. And I got better. And she really nursed me back to health. And um, I'm not really sure if any time in my life I have felt as taken care of. Before I left Moscow the next day, I asked her if there was anything I could bring her from America. And she said that, yes, I could bring her a book of Pushkin stories for her young son. She wanted to read them to him. And that was all she wanted. As for Roland, when I got to his office, he was furious. I had made him late for his deliveries. And so I offered to help with them. And he said, Pfft. 
which I took for a yes. So, so I drove along with him, I rode with him, and he would stop and make his deliveries of these incredible ice cream flavors, tomato basil, Szechuan, Calvados, goat cheese. And every time he'd get back into the car, he would fire off question after question to me. You know, have, have you ever been to New York? Do you like Andy Warhol? Uh, have you ever seen a cowboy? How about an Indian? What is the point of baseball? And every time I would answer in my fluent French, he would correct my French every single time, which I found very irritating. Finally, uh, after this had been going on for a while, I shot back a sarcastic, well, you know, we could speak English if it would be easier for you. And he said, why would we speak English? We are in my country. We speak French. So we got off to a bit of a rocky start. But toward the end of the day, we wound up in this small town, and I watched, after he made his deliveries, as he handed out free ice cream cones to every person who walked by his van. So I asked him, do you live here? And he said, no, I, I grew up here. And we started to walk around, and he showed me scenes from his childhood. So he showed me uh, a window that he had broken with a yo-yo, and the house of a girl he'd once had a crush on and the church where he got married, and then finally, the home of a woman who had dug up an army helmet in her backyard, um, a US Army helmet, and had kept it displayed in her kitchen. And I said, why did she keep it? And he said, we didn't know anything about that soldier. The only thing we knew was that he had come to France to help liberate us. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And I thought about, my own grandfather, and the picture of him as a young man in his army helmet, and I got a little teary. And we sat there on this wall eating ice cream, and, um, and we became friends, and we still are. So now that I've told you a little bit about yourself, about these people, sorry, um, I'd like to know if your number changed, your one to 10, if it even, changed slightly, just a, just a half of a number, um, I'd like you to raise your hand. Oh my gosh, almost everyone. Great. This is why I say it's a powerful tool. It's called a travel story, and its capacity is to make people care about someone they have never met, someone they probably never will meet. These stories were actually not my own. I edit a um, a collection, an annual collection of true travel stories by women. And the two I just told you were from this year's collection and last year's. It's a different sort of category of travel writing than most people normally read. It's not the magazine feature with lots of details about the thread count of the sheets at a hotel in Dubai. And it's not really journalism, the hard-hitting investigative reports of social injustice and corruption and poverty in war-torn countries. It's a category of travel, of, of travel writing that gets a little bit less attention and a lot less pay, called personal essay. I realize that it may seem unlikely that telling a travel story could contribute significantly to our conversation about major global issues. But think about it this way. For as long as we can remember, stories have been the way that we connect to each other as humans, the way we influence one another, affect one another, persuade one another. They are endowed with the power to make us care. And making us care is the seed of change. It's the impetus for action. When we ask someone, to give of their time, their money, their skills, their minds to a developing nation or a country in need, what we're really asking them to do is to open their hearts and to care, again, about someone they've never met. And many people do because they recognize that we are all the same species, we're all human. But some people need a little bit more, they need something else. And maybe that could be a story. Maybe they could feel a bond to a specific community because, for example, 
they once read a very moving story about, let's just say, some kids in India who've decided to take on a polio vaccination. Or maybe they've read a story about a loving family in Afghanistan or Iraq, or a very talented schoolgirl in Nigeria. And they suddenly care. So, with that said, I'm going to ask for a little bit more audience participation, but I'm not actually asking you to do anything today. I'm hoping that you'll do something in the future. I imagine that many of you in the audience today like to travel, and because you're here today, I'm going to take a further leap and say that when you travel, you're the sort of person who likes to give back to, your, to the communities that you're visiting. And there are so many wonderful ways to do this when you're on the road. You can donate blood, you can visit hospitals or schools, you can educate, you can start programs, you can build homes, volunteer. And, in addition, you can do this. You can change the way you approach travel. You can decide that you're a travel writer and that you will make people care. The next time you go anywhere, whether it's a vacation to Europe or a hiking trip to Nepal, a quick jaunt to Mexico, I challenge you to meet someone amazing and write a short story about that person. Now, I imagine that many of you are thinking, oh, you do not want to write, read my writing. I am a bad writer. But I'm here to tell you, it, it matters a lot less than you think. In the last two years, editing these travel collections, I read more than 600 travel essays to find the 65 that I would publish. And I think you'd be surprised to learn how many of the stories that made it were written by women who had never published a single word. Of course, as an editor, what I was looking for was great writing, great stories, great characters. But I was also looking for great heart. And even though some of the stories came to me a bit rough, in the end, the stories that made the cut were the ones that made me care. And I strongly believe that everyone here today could write a story that would make someone care. So, I ask you to start small. The next time you go somewhere, bring a journal. You all got journals today. And write a story, four paragraphs even, about someone you met. And then share it. Send it out in an email to your 10 closest friends or submit it to a contest or to your newspaper. Put it on Facebook. You all have Facebook. Everyone has Facebook. <laughs> Facebook has more users now than the United States has citizens. And they say that the average Facebook user has 130 friends. So that means that, and probably many of you have more than that on Facebook, but that means that if everyone in the audience today wrote one story and put it on Facebook, that story could reach almost 20,000 people. But even if it just reached one, it would still be important. It's never been easier to write down our stories and to find people to read them. But what is becoming rare is the urge to make that happen, the urge to invite connections into our travel lives, and then to really reflect on the meaning and then to share them with others. I won't be the first to bring up the point that we are becoming a more disconnected society. Every, everything we want can be found online. All of our most pressing questions can be found by opening our phone. Um, but if we want to make any real kind of difference in the world, we need to become more connected. And I don't mean that we need to just embrace the personal encounters that come our way. I mean, we have to go look for them. We have to initiate them. We have to foster them. And we may have to manufacture them. There's this story I love about this Tibetan monk named Chagdud Rinpoche 
who, uh, before he passed away, he used to travel around the United States teaching meditation. And he would never allow his driver to pay for gas at the pump. He would always insist that they go into the station together and pay the attendant in person just so he could create the possibility of a moment of human connection. Now, if you ask any travel writer, they'll tell you, well, yeah, that's just part of my job. Travel writers are obligated to meet people, to ask questions, to pay attention. And with that comes a heightened sense of awareness, a heightened sense of observation, and some great rewards. On top of a good story, you gain a much richer experience. And it's a much richer experience for everyone. You become sort of an ambassador for your country. And people start to view you not as just the average tourist, but as a curious, engaged, interested global citizen, maybe even a part of their family. Travel can teach us that the whole world is one big family. We are kin. And then you can take that lesson and you can teach others. You can share your stories and one by one, those who read them may begin to recognize the commonality of the world's people. And they may begin to reject prejudice and apathy. So, there are seven billion people in the world. And each one has a story. I hope that the next time you travel, you'll listen to one. And then I hope you'll tell it. Thank you.